USS Massachusetts, known by her crew affectionately as Big Mammy, was a South Dakota-class battleship, and considered the third, but, um, okay, if you've seen my earlier videos on battleships, you know that sometimes the uh, exact birthdays of these battleships gets very confusing, and their numbers aren't exactly reflective of when they were actually, you know, built. There were four South Dakotas. The oldest is definitely, well, South Dakota. And the youngest, the baby of the family, is Alabama. But Indiana and Massachusetts, the second and third, respectively, get a little confusing, because Massachusetts was laid down and launched before Indiana, but Indiana was commissioned first. So, I, I guess in terms of which one is older, it really depends on how you view like, these ships' birthdays. Is their birthday their commission date? Is it their launch date? I generally look at it as South Dakota's the oldest, Alabama's the baby, and Indiana and Massachusetts are the twins of the family, because they were very close in terms of their build dates. But regardless of any of that, Massachusetts, as a South Dakota class, is a fast battleship, not a dreadnought. Fast battleships are technically an evolution of dreadnoughts, but they're not considered in the same category, as the technology had advanced to the point of becoming something else entirely. While still battleships, fast battleships, given their name, were designed to be a lot faster than dreadnoughts while still retaining the armor and armament that Dreadnoughts were known for. And the South Dakotas as a class were ordered in the context of global naval rearmament during the time that the Washington Treaty System that had controlled battleship construction during the 1920s and the 30s was starting to break down. In 1936, when Japan abandoned the treaty system, the US Navy decided to invoke the Escalator Clause in the Second London Treaty that allowed displacements to rise to 46,000 tons and armament to increase to 16-inch guns. Congress, though, actually objected to it and that meant the designers for the new ships were forced to keep the displacement as close to 35,000 long tons as reasonably possible, while still incorporating larger guns and armor sufficient to defeat guns of the same caliber. Massachusetts, in particular, wound up being 680 feet long, with a beam of 108 feet 2 inches and a draft of 35 feet 1 inches. She displaced... 38,580 tons as designed, and at full combat load, could hit 45,233 tons. She was powered by four General Electric steam turbines, and each one of those drove a single propeller shaft. The steam was provided by eight oil-fired Babcock and Wilcox boilers. The turbines were rated at 130,000 shaft horsepower, and they were meant to push Massachusetts to a speed of 27.5 knots and she had a cruising range of 15,000 nautical miles at a speed of 15 knots. She also carried three Vought OS-2U Kingfisher floatplanes for reconnaissance purposes, and they were launched by a pair of catapults on her fantail. During peacetime, her crew numbered 1,793 officers and enlisted men, but during World War II, that would actually be increased substantially to 2,500 men. Her armament consisted of a main battery of nine 16-inch Mark VI guns and three triple turrets on her center line. Two of those were in a super-firing pair forward, with the third in the rear. Her secondary battery consisted of 25-inch guns mounted in twin turrets that were clustered amidships, and as designed, she was given an anti-aircraft battery of 12 1.1-inch guns and 12 50 cal M2 Browning machine guns. But by the time she was done, she was actually given a battery of 6 quadruple 40mm Bofors guns in place of the 1.1-inch guns and 35 20mm Orlikan autocannons instead of the 50 cals. Her main armor belt was 12.2 inches thick and her main armored deck was up to 6 inches thick. The main battery turrets were given 18 inch thick faces, and they were mounted atop barbettes that were 17.3 inches thick. Her conning tower also had 16 inch thick sides. 
For once, I actually get to skip the interwar period when talking about a battleship. Because Massachusetts was laid down at Bethlehem Steel's Four River Shipyard on July 20th, 1939. And she'd be launched September 23rd, 1941. That's only a little over two months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. When her fitting out work was completed, she'd be commissioned into the fleet on May 12th, 1942, not a moment too soon. The latest in the United States Navy military hardware was indeed ready to go. She conducted her shakedown cruise before she moved to Casco Bay in Maine. And then she'd be assigned to the Western Naval Task Force, which was supposed to support Operation Torch, the invasion of French North Africa. She got underway on October 24th to join the rest of the unit, and she met up with them at sea four days after that. She then became the flagship of Rear Admiral Henry Kent Hewitt, and was a part of Task Group 34.1, which included heavy cruisers Wichita and Tuscaloosa, as well as four destroyers. They rendezvoused with the rest of the invasion fleet on October 28th, roughly 450 nautical miles southeast of Cape Race, in Canada, and then they headed across the Atlantic. Massachusetts would find herself in the heat of combat almost immediately upon reaching the operation sites. She would be a part of the naval battle of Casablanca, which would begin early on the morning of November 8th. Massachusetts and the ships with her were given the job of neutralizing primary French defenses. That included coastal guns on El Hank, several submarines, as well as a partially completed battleship, the French Jean Bart. Jean was at anchor in the harbor, and only half of her main battery had actually been installed. Massachusetts would open fire at 7.04 at a range of 22,000 meters, and Jean Bart would actually fire back at her with what little armament she had, and as such, Massachusetts would fire at her at 7.40. Allied forces would split their fire to try to cover as many points as possible. Wichita and Tuscaloosa dealt with the French batteries on El Hank, as well as the submarine pens, while Massachusetts handled Jean Bart. But they also had to contend with other Vichy French naval forces that were being led by the cruiser, Primoget. But Massachusetts and her cruisers were able to break up attempts by the French destroyers to attack the fleet, and would continue attacking Jean Bart, during the course of which Massachusetts hit her five times, and did disable her main battery turret. That meant Jean was no longer a major threat, so Massachusetts and the cruisers could shift their fire to focus solely on the coastal artillery batteries, as well as an ammunition dump and merchant ships that were just hanging out in the harbor. One of her 16-inch shells actually struck the floating dry dock that held a submarine, Le Concurrent. That dry dock sank, but the sub wasn't actually damaged and able to get underway. She didn't last long, however. A PBY Catalina would sink her later at sea. And eventually, the French relented. They agreed to a ceasefire on November 11th. And that allowed Task Force 34.1 to be detached for other operations. Massachusetts headed back to the United States on November 12th to begin preparations for a transfer to the Pacific Theater. Massachusetts would reach New Caledonia on March 4th, 1943, and spent the next few months just escorting convoys to the Solomon Islands to support operations during that campaign. On June 30th, she would provide cover for an amphibious assault on New Georgia, which was part of Operation Cartwheel. And at that time, she was assigned to the battleship group for Task Force 36.3, which included her twin sister, Indiana, as well as their older cousin, North Carolina. Over the next week, the Japanese would launch multiple attacks on American forces that were involved in the campaign, but none actually went after the battleship force. Massachusetts would leave the area on November 19th to take part in the Gilbert and Marshall Islands campaign, and was responsible for escorting the carrier task group, TG 50.2. She was still with Indiana and North Carolina during this, and that group would carry out a series of air attacks on Macon, Tarawa, and Abamama on the Gilbert Islands. And those operations were in support of the landings, both to weaken Japanese defenses and to isolate their garrisons 
to make it more difficult for the Japanese to reinforce them or launch counterattacks. On December 8th, she did take part in a bombardment of Japanese positions at Nauru, and for that operation she was actually detached to form Task Group 50.8 under the command of Rear Admiral Willis Lee. She was joined by North Carolina, Indiana, as well as South Dakota and Washington, as well as several destroyer escorts. The operations during this campaign continued until January of 1944, and during the invasion of Kwajalein, Massachusetts would be transferred to Task Group 58.1 under the command of 5th Fleet. And for most of the Pacific Theater, Massachusetts would serve with the Fast Carrier Task Force, TF-58, with the job of screening the carriers from surface attacks and contributing her own heavy anti-aircraft battery against Japanese air attacks. The carriers would strike numerous targets in the Marshalls, again to isolate the garrison on Kwajalein, and Massachusetts herself did bombard the island on January 30th alongside Washington, North Carolina, and Indiana. The day before the Marines would go ashore, Massachusetts would continue her role as an escort for Fast Carrier Task Force during Operation Hailstone on February 17th, which was a huge attack on the island of Truk, a primary staging area for the Japanese fleet in the Central Pacific. She was part of Task Group 58.3 for that particular attack, and afterwards, she would move forward with the fleet to help conduct a series of strikes in the islands of Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, which provoked a lot of Japanese air attacks in response. Massachusetts used her heavy anti-aircraft battery for much of the fighting, and once things settled down in that area, the fleet then moved to the Caroline Islands and struck several islands in that area. On April 22nd, they supported the landing at Hollandia in western New Guinea. And on the way back from that area, they decided to hit truck again. On May 1st, Massachusetts joined a bombardment group, designated TG-58.7, that attacked Pon Pai in the Senyavin Islands, again under Lee's command. After that, she withdrew to Anawetek in the Marshall Islands. From there, she was attached for an overhaul in the Puget Sound Navy Yard, which included having her guns relined, as she'd managed to wear them out by that point. As such, she was unavailable for the Mariana and Peleu Islands campaign. But she was able to rejoin the fleet, now under 3rd Fleet Command, by late August, and she joined Task Group 38.3, and participated in strikes on the island of Mindano in the Philippines to neutralize Japanese-held airfields that could interfere with the landings. And from the 12th to the 14th of December, the fleet would move to strike targets in the Visayas. Massachusetts continued escorting the carriers to further strikes on Luzon, and this month-long campaign would destroy roughly a thousand Japanese aircraft and sink or neutralize 150 of their ships. On October 6th, she would sortie with the rest of the fleet to begin preparations for the invasion of the Philippines. The first operation would be a major strike on Japanese air bases on the island of Okinawa on October 10th, which was part of an effort to reduce Japan's ability to actually interfere with the landings at all. From the 12th to the 14th of October, the Fast Carrier Task Force struck bases on Formosa, now known as Taiwan, before they returned to the invasion fleet off Leyte, which was supposed to be the original target. Over the course of the Okinawa and Formosa strikes, the fleet did come under heavy air attacks, but Massachusetts in particular wasn't actually engaged, as the Japanese attacks would concentrate on task groups 38.1 and 38.4, not 38.3 that Massachusetts was a part of. On October 16th, a group of Japanese cruisers and destroyers would sortie to attack American vessels that had been damaged in the attacks, which prompted Massachusetts, along with the rest of 38.3 as well as 38.2, to return north to engage them, but they actually failed to find them before they returned to port at Amami, Oshima. The following day, Massachusetts and the rest of the task group would return to strike Luzon, which was the same day that elements of the 6th Army went ashore at Leyte, and raids on Luzon continued until October 19th. The landings on Leyte led to the activation of Operation Shogo-1, 
which is the Japanese Navy's planned major counterattack to Allied landings in the Philippines. It was a complicated operation with three separate fleets. The first mobile fleet, now labeled the Northern Force under Jisuboro Ozawa, the Central Force under Takeo Kurita, and the Southern Force under Shoji Nishimura. Ozawa's Northern Force had carriers, but they were depleted of most of their aircraft, so their job was to serve as a decoy for Kurita's and Nishimura's battleships, so they could approach and attack the invasion fleet directly. Kurita's ships were indeed detected in the San Bernardino Strait on October 24th, and that resulted in the Battle of the Sabuyan Sea. American carrier aircraft would sink the battleship Musashi, which caused Kurita to temporarily reverse course. But that convinced Admiral William F. Halsey, who was the commander of the Third Fleet, to send the Fast Carrier Task Force to destroy the First Mobile Fleet, which had by then been detected. But later that evening, Commodore Arleigh Burke, who was Admiral Mark Minster's Chief of Staff, actually suggested that Minster detach Massachusetts and South Dakota, along with a pair of light cruisers and a destroyer screening force to send them ahead of the carriers to fight a night action with the Northern Force. Minster agreed, and at 1712 hours, ordered Rear Admiral Forrest Sherma to put the plan into action. But Halsey intervened before Sherman could actually send ships north, and overruled Minster. He ordered to keep the battleships with the main fleet, and as a result, Massachusetts would steam north with the carriers, and on the way, Halsey would establish Task Force 34, which would consist of Massachusetts and five other fast battleships, as well as seven cruisers and 18 destroyers, commanded by Vice Admiral Willis Lee. Task Force 34 was a raid ahead of the carriers, to serve as their screen, and on the morning of October 25th, Mitzger began his first attack on the Northern Force, which would initiate the battle off Cape Angano. The battle would include six strikes on the Japanese fleet, and it would result in the sinking of all four carriers, as well as damaging two older-style battleships that had been converted into hybrid carriers. But unknown to Halsey and Mitzger, Kurita had resumed his approach through the San Bernardino Strait on October 24th and passed into Leyte Gulf the next morning. They had fallen into the Japanese's trap. While Mitzger was occupied with the decoy Northern Force, Kurita moved to attack the invasion fleet, but he would actually be stopped in the battle off Samar because he ran into Taffy 3, who had had enough of this whole situation. Taffy 3 fought back so ferociously that Kurita pulled his entire force back as he thought he was dealing with a fast carrier group, when in reality Taffy 3 was just a bunch of escort carriers, destroyers, and destroyer escorts. During the battle, frantic calls for help would lead Halsey to detach Lee's battleships to head south and intervene in the desperate situation, but Halsey had waited more than an hour after receiving orders from Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, who was the commander of the entire U.S. Pacific Fleet, by the way, to detach TF-34. And they were still steaming north during that time. As a result, the delay would add two hours to the battleship's voyage south, and a need to refuel the destroyers further slowed their progress. By the time they got there, Taffy 3, despite taking heavy losses, had managed to make the Japanese retreat on their own, and Halsey would detach battleships Iowa and New Jersey as TG-34.5 to pursue Kurita through the San Bernardino Strait, while Lee would take the rest of his ships further southwest to try to cut off his escape, but they both arrived too late. The fleet would withdraw to Ulithi to replenish fuel and ammunition before embarking on a series of raids on Japanese airfields and other facilities on Luzon. Massachusetts was now a member of Task Group 38.1. The carriers would strike Manila on December 14th, but after the fleet withdrew on December 17th, Typhoon Cobra would sweep through the area. And this was a disastrous situation that sank three destroyers. But fortunately, Massachusetts could hold her own even in the tough conditions. She did not suffer significant damage during the incident. She did report a single injury among her crew, as well as the loss of two of her reconnaissance aircraft, but nothing major. 
From December 30th to January 23rd, 1945, Massachusetts operated with the carriers of Task Force 38, which made a series of raids on Formosa and Okinawa, and this was to support the invasion of Lingayen Gulf in the northern Philippines. By February, the Fast Carrier Task Force had reverted to 5th Fleet Command, and Massachusetts was now part of Task Group 58.1 but she mostly carried on her role as an escort for the fleet carriers during the series of strikes on Honshu, and these were made to support the upcoming invasion of Iwo Jima. The task force would depart Ulithi on February 10th, and after conducting exercises off Tinian on February 12th, as well as refueling on the 14th, the attacks on Honshu would begin on February 16th. Further raids would be carried out the following day, and on the 18th, they would withdraw to refuel at sea. The carriers also raided Iwo Jima during battle there, and the task group would contribute their own firepower beginning on February 20th. They withdrew to refuel again on February 24th, and then made additional strikes on the Tokyo area. Over the course of the 25th and 26th of February, they then steamed south to raid Okinawa on March 1st, before they withdrew back to Ulithi, which they reached on March 4th. They sortied again on March 14th for yet another raid on Japan. Massachusetts would refuel on the way on March 16th, and two days after that, the carriers began another series of attacks on mainland Japan, starting with targets on the island of Kyushu to weaken Japanese forces before the invasion of Okinawa in April. A large counterattack was, however, carried out by the Japanese, and that consisted of 48 kamikazes, but those attacks were concentrated on Task Group 58.4, and as a result, Massachusetts was again not heavily damaged. They just don't really want to fight her. The French did, but the Japanese are like, no, no, not that one. We're, we're good. The next day, during raids on the Kerr area, Japanese bombers attacked the fleet and badly damaged the carrier, USS Wasp, but Massachusetts was again not hit. Heavy damage inflicted on other units, though, prompted Mitscher to withdraw his fleet and reorganize it entirely. Massachusetts would remain where she was, however, but two cruisers were detached to escort Wasp back to Ulithi. On March 23rd, Task Force 58 steamed southwest to begin preparatory attacks on Okinawa. The following day, the carriers of Task Group 58.1 did destroy a convoy of eight transports off Kyushu, and Massachusetts was detached in company with Indiana, New Jersey, and Wisconsin as Task Force 59, specifically to shell Okinawa. Massachusetts would spend much of April operating off the island, helping to fend off heavy Japanese air attacks and the carrier task routes rotated through the station, with two groups in action at any given time. Kamikaze attacks were incredibly frequent, but Massachusetts was never targeted by them. In late May, 3rd Fleet would actually resume command of the task force, and Massachusetts' unit was renumbered to Task Group 38.1. On June 5th, she passed through another typhoon, but again, she took it like a champ and had no serious damage. Five days after that, she then steamed to shell Japanese facilities on the island of Minami Daito Jima. And following that, Task Force 38 withdrew to Leyte Gulf after three months of continuous operations. They would take that time to prepare the next major operation off Japan. The Fast Carrier Task Force would sortie again on July 1st for attacks on Honshu, initially concentrating on the area around Tokyo. On July 14th, Massachusetts would be detached to form Task Group 34.8.1, with Indiana, South Dakota, two heavy cruisers, and nine destroyers. They were being sent to bombard an industrial complex in Kamaishi. That actually included the Japan Iron Company and the Kamaishi Steelworks. That complex was critical to Japanese supply chain. It was the second largest iron and steel manufacturing center. Two weeks later, they repeated the bombardment, that time targeting industrial facilities at Hamamatsu. For that operation, they were actually joined by the Royal Navy, battleship HMS King George V, as well as three destroyers, and another attack on Kamaishi would follow on August 9th, and that time they'd be reinforced by their baby sister, 
Alabama. Yep, by the end of the war, Massachusetts, Indiana, South Dakota, and Alabama were all together. The Japanese would surrender on August 15th, and that meant that Massachusetts could finally stop shooting them. And she departed the region on September 1st, bound for Puget Sound for a much needed overhaul. The work would last until January 28th, 1946, and then she sailed south to San Francisco, and then went on over to Hampton Roads in Virginia, which she reached on April 22nd. She was then decommissioned on March 27th, 1947 at Norfolk, Virginia, and assigned to the Atlantic Reserve Fleet. For a time, there was the consideration to actually modernize Massachusetts, as well as her siblings, should they be needed in future active service. In March of 1954, a program to equip them with secondary batteries that would consist of 10 twin 3-inch guns was proposed, but ultimately it just wasn't carried out. Another plan involved converting them into a guided missile battleship. This conversion would have involved all three of her main battery turrets being removed and replaced with a twin RIM-8 Talos missile launcher forward and two RIM-24 Tartar launchers aft, as well as adding anti-submarine weapons and equipment to handle helicopters. But the cost would be $120 million. The Navy just didn't see a need to spend it. And Massachusetts would remain out of service until June 1st, 1962, when she was stricken from the Naval Vessel Register. While she had been in reserve, the Navy had removed around 5,000 tons of equipment for use on other vessels, including both the explosive-driven catapults used to launch her float planes. But in a very rare case, Massachusetts does not have an unhappy ending, as many of her battleship cousins would. I've gone on record in other videos pointing out how difficult it is to preserve large ships. For one thing, there's just less space for them since they need to be in water generally, so you're restricted to the coast, and then what parts of the coast can handle that? And any person who's ever owned a ship can tell you that they require constant attention to keep afloat, especially in salt water, which really, really loves rust and things. When you compare ships to pretty much any other kind of vehicle, whether it be a locomotive or a plane or a car, I mean, any of those, even in the largest, can have a building effectively constructed around it. But a battleship, not... Not really something you can just throw in a garage somewhere, you know? But when Massachusetts was stricken and stated for disposal, a group of her former crew lobbied heavily to have her preserved as a museum ship. The sort of thing isn't unheard of, as many former crew members of these old ships tend to get pretty attached to them and don't want to see them utterly destroyed. In this case, they were successful. The Massachusetts Memorial Committee did raise enough money to straight up buy the ship from the Navy. And on June 8th, 1965, the Navy would transfer ownership of her to the state of Massachusetts. Two months later, on August 14th, the ship was anchored in Fall River, Massachusetts, at what is known as Battleship Cove. This museum area also includes the destroyer Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., the submarine USS Lionfish, a pair of PT boats, as well as some other exhibits. They actually used to have an East German Corvette Hidden Sea, but she was actually scrapped just a few months ago. Yeah, I've been asked to talk about this, so he here was the problem. This is an East German Corvette, and this type of ship was actually designed to be disposable. As a result, the museum found that fixing her was going to be, uh, expensive. Like, really, really, really expensive. So expensive that there was no way they were ever going to be able to afford it and still take care of all their other ships. So, she was scrapped. And as much as I hate it, I also get it. But she did sit alongside Massachusetts for many years as well. In the early 1980s, when the Navy actually would reactivate the Iowa class, parts of Massachusetts were taken away, particularly engine room components that were no longer available in the Navy's inventory. She would be declared a National Historic Landmark and added to the National Register of Historic Places on January 14th, 1986. Apart from the material the Navy took away, both before she was sold and in the 1980s, she still remains, mostly, in her wartime configuration. However, as I've mentioned, these ships require constant attention, and eventually Massachusetts did require some, um, well, work. 
In November of 1998, she would be closed to the public in preparation for her departure for Boston, where she was going to undergo an overhaul. She headed out on her 300-mile trip to the capital of Massachusetts at 6.30 on November 4th, 1998, with a friendly neighborhood tugboat. She would arrive on November 7th and enter Boston's dry dock number three, where an inspection of her hull did show that, oh, wow, saltwater rust stuff, you guys. She needed additional steel plating placed over her hull at the waterline to protect against that corrosion. And they also found leaking rivets and decided there was a need to remove two of her propellers for repair purposes as well. Over the next four months, she underwent the repairs to correct these problems, which is pretty fast, actually. And that included the addition of nearly 225,000 pounds of steel to her hull, as well as coating her with a compound known as Red Hand Hypoxy, which is a type of resin that basically encases the hull against future deterioration. And in March of 1999, she emerged from her dry docking period and returned to Battleship Cove under tow, arriving at her berth at 15.30 on March 13th, 1999, to a gathered crowd of citizens, dignitaries, veterans, and civic officials. She still remains there to this day, a proud symbol of the state of Massachusetts, as well as all who served aboard her and in World War II. Like I said, it is exceedingly rare for a ship, especially of Massachusetts size, to be preserved, but she still stands proud to this day. And incredibly, she's not alone. And no, I'm not talking about the Iowas. I'm talking about her own baby sister. Alabama was also preserved and is at the Battleship Memorial Park in Mobile, Alabama, and has been there since June 11th, 1964. While it is hideously unlikely that either one of these sisters will ever meet again, let alone serve again, they're still with us, so they can keep telling their stories to future generations. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson, 131-232, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Brian, Jack Carson's Row of Videos, Lord Off 444, Mark Holding, Murder Drones Doll, A Person 723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Royal Hudson 2860, Icer for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, S Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Will Jack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Joshua Long, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Hayden Negro, Caleb Rainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Arizona Hot Rail, Liam Wright, Mr. Sleepy, and Dr. Razor 78. Till next time, this is Darkness and a Bitch Wall of Fun. Farewell.